Lord, so that'll be very much appreciated. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we are gathered here in groups. We come together in all kinds of groups. In this case, we're a group interested in wisdom or knowledge. Uh, we also have hordes. We also have crowds. Sometimes we hope that whatever type of groups get together, some bit of wisdom emerges from it or some knowledge gets shared among them. There's precedence for this. Over 350 years ago, the Royal Society for Improving Natural Knowledge uh, published a nascent science journal. And one of the articles I found quite interesting in, the first, uh, in that first um, episode, in that first journal, was some observations of swarms of strange insects and the mischiefs done by them. In other words, that's not bad for a title if we were to talk about bug bounty programs or the good and the bad of a bug bounty program. But really what I'm aiming for here is to talk about improving knowledge. How can we measure a crowdsourced security program? Is it cost effective? Is it working for us with time? And one of the themes I'm calling out here are groups or collective nouns. So we have swarms of insects. We might also have a cacophony of hordes or a scrutiny of crowds. If you're a Duran Duran fan, you might think of this along the lines of uh, straddle the line between discord and rhyme. In other words, hordes have a lot of noise to them. Maybe there is a little bit of wisdom, but it's going to get hidden there. We want to tease it out. And crowds themselves may have something beneficial in terms of security, but they may also not need to be as big as we think they are. Maybe three actually is a crowd and an effective one at that. And that's where we need to dive into some more focused questions. So we're here to talk about security, but we want to make sure we're using our time wisely. We came here for a 35, 40 minute presentation. Hopefully we're spending our time wisely. We paid a training budget or we paid to attend a conference. We're also paying to discover vulnerabilities. How are we spending that money in a smart way? And of course, finally, are we, are we making an impact? Are we doing something that we can have a measurable difference in improving the world of web application security? So a great place to start are bug bounties themselves, the actual payouts. This is a very concrete, very direct example of quantifying risk, especially dollars. So very often, a program might have anywhere from a zero to a $15,000 range, or maybe a zero to $5,000 range for the payouts. But within that range, you'll find some interesting things. The average is very unlikely to be in the middle, more likely to be perhaps down to the $800 or $1,000 range on the average payout for a vulnerability. And even within vulnerabilities, there's going to be a wide variance. So you don't necessarily say $800 per cross-site scripting or per OWASP top 10 category. You say based on the impact, perhaps it's the $50 for the type of bug that's just a cockroach, a cross-site scripting that's everywhere. Or perhaps it's $10,000 for a more vicious bug, a poisonous bug that has much bigger impact on our web applications. So already we have money tied to risk that's very quantifiable and very real for us to understand. But what I'm going to start to dive into is how do we look at these types of programs or look at these in different ways and say, what if we had, for example, a $15,000 absolute budget to pay out? How many people are earning that budget? In other words, how responsive is the crowd? How big is that crowd? Perhaps there's just a very small group of people that's earning half of that payout. Perhaps 80% of that budget is going to, to a very small percentage of users, leaving, for example, only $3,000 for all of the rest of the, the bug bounty researchers to battle over. So one of the things that I've been doing and talking about so far in terms of the price of a bounty or the price of a, of a vulnerability, those are all for valid vulnerability. So paying $800 for that cross-site scripting or that CSRF vulnerability. But you also have a lot of noise. And this is where we start to examine what does it look like when we open up a bug bounty program um, on a web application that has had no security testing before. What, how would, might we compare that to pen test data? So here is a year's worth of data I took from uh, several bug bounty programs and several pen tests. And roughly speaking, a third of the reports of the absolute reports that come in for a bug bounty became valid, whereas roughly 90% of them were valid for pen tests. So already we can say there's these huge categories, just items that are out of scope or items that are invalid. There's also an interesting category of items that are duplicate. 
Now, duplicate items are not necessarily a fault of bug bounty researchers, they could, but they can be a very much a frustration of them. For example, if you have a bug that gets reported and it takes you 30 days to fix it, or perhaps 60 days to fix it, that's a long amount of time for that bug to exist in a production web application that more and more people might identify it, report it, and report it, and report it, and that's the case where many kinds of duplicates can come from. So it's a way then to say you're actually incurring that overhead or adding that noise based on your own perhaps weaknesses in processes or slow um, methodologies in terms of deploying fixes. So we come to our first, perhaps not too surprising, insight, which is really that noise, of course, is going to increase the cost of your vulnerability discovery and it's going to make you a lot less in, uh, efficient. But what I'm trying to do here is rather than just throw up some platitudes, build this data around it and point to ways we can consider and illustrate when is, when is something cost effective, when is it efficient. So as I continue this exploration, one of the things that I want to make sure that I clarify is that this isn't, a, uh, this isn't an, an attempt to position bug bounty or pen tests as better than the others. And I'll talk about scanners in a little bit as well. It's merely an idea to say we have these different sources of vulnerability discovery or ways of identifying vulnerabilities in our applications. And we want to know what works best or what's good about them. This is, again, some data of different types of findings reported between different programs. A few things stood out for me. One was that pen tests tend to excel on authentication and session types of findings. That's perhaps not too surprising because penetration testers tend to be granted High, high privilege accounts. They tend to be granted the privilege or the credentials in order to conduct that testing against an application, whereas a lot of bug bounty tests relies on self-registration or free, app, or free um, accounts to be set up. So perhaps not too surprising there. Another thing where bug bounties stand out down here, sensitive data exposure, tend to be reported a lot more on bug bounty. Perhaps this is a case where you have significant low effort for a high reward and say, I can read everybody's email, or I can enumerate everybody's phone number. That's a possibly very trivial thing to script, but a highly impactful and a good reward. You're going towards that $10,000 range rather than down to $50 range. The other thing, though, that both of them were very highly reporting was the misconfiguration. Now, bug bounty, again, was a bit higher here, but this is where I want to call out scanners. Now, scanners in addition to being a uh, classic cult movie from the 80s, which maybe some of you have seen or not, scanners are also tools that are available for discovering vulnerabilities. Misconfigurations should be a category where scanners excel, the same as components with known vulnerabilities, and perhaps to a degree some easier of the SQL injection or cross-site scripting. But some lessons or some stories we might build around this type of data is to ask ourselves or to investigate why are misconfigurations so prevalent? Is this because these applications haven't been using scanners at all and they're diving straight into a bug bounty program or straight into a pen test? In other words, overpaying for the, for, to know about vulnerabilities that should be trivially identified by a code scanner, by a dynamic scanner, et cetera. So keep that in mind about we have a pretty much, a, a very good overlap between bug bounties and pen tests. Here's another way to look at those two types of approaches. Here I've charted basically the window of discovery, the days between the first vulnerability report and the last vulnerability report versus how many were found within. For the most part, pretty much bug bounties and pen tests are probably going to find about the same amount of vulnerabilities. What stands out is the amount of time. So a pen test might traditionally be a week or maybe two weeks type of effort. Whereas a bug bounty, you may be waiting two months, 100 days, or the entire year to get that same amount of vulnerability information. This becomes important if you're trying to align these vulnerability discovery or conversely trying to align fixing the vulnerabilities with a DevOps tasks or with an agile methodology. Meaning if, what, if you have a release cycle that's every four weeks or every six weeks, it doesn't help to have to be waiting two months or three months or longer to find all the vulnerabilities within that major release. Why not aim for something that is going to be more time efficient for you, get that two-week effort, discover those vulnerabilities, fix them, and then move on. 
And what we'd also imagine, too, is that scanners should be right around here as well. Scanners can run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The catch is they're going to have some ceiling. So they're not going to be able to find all the types of vulnerabilities that humans can. So we can invoke the magic words of things like business logic or complex workflows. And those are areas where scanners are going to need both care and feeding as well as a lot of triage. In other words, there's going to be a lot of noise that they're going to incur as well. But let's take another look at a time dimension. So I'm a big Doctor Who fan, so that's why I wanted to talk about time first. I will look at the days since. Um, I mentioned the, the philosophical transactions. It was published in, in 1665. It took another 120 years before they published their first article by a woman, or about 45,000 days, which on this graph would be perhaps over in the corner. But if we're looking at days since from a bug bounty perspective, we see that 50% of the programs had about four-day gap between valid reports. So in other words, you can already start to build a, a simple model or simple expectation that we're probably going to get maybe one to two vulnerability reports a week. And let's say if we get two vulnerability reports a week and we're paying roughly $800 to $1,000 per vuln, perhaps we can say our budget for the year on payouts is going to be $100,000. So already, at least we can have something that's a little bit predictive, or at least a baseline to start with. But another reason I wanted to highlight this is that you start to get to 95%, that, that category, where you have 20 days between volumes. Or in 2016, if you slice it by year, what was interesting is that you'd have a week, two weeks, or a month since the last vulnerability was reported. So what are some ways we can interrogate this sort of information? One idea is that if we haven't had any valid vulnerability report for a month, perhaps we are optimistic, hopefully not over-optimistic, but perhaps we found every single vulnerability that exists in that particular application. Or slightly less optimistic, perhaps we found all of the easy vulnerabilities in that application, if it's been over 30 days and there's been silence. So there's a couple ways we can react to this. If this is a legacy application or an application that isn't under active development, maybe that is a bit of a safe bet. We can be optimistic. On the other hand, this is an application that is being developed um, on a weekly basis, or you have two-week sprints, for example, and it's been over 30 days since your last valid report. Maybe that means the, the crowd is losing interest, that your bug bounty reporters have moved on elsewhere, or the easy items have been found. This is a way to step back and say, how might we re-engage the crowd? Perhaps we want to increase the payment schedule. Perhaps we want to double the payment schedule. Or perhaps we want to identify different groups or subgroups within that bug bounty crowd and figure out how can we say, we have a new feature, we'd like you to take a week or a weekend to take a look at it, and we'll pay a fixed price for it. Or here is a fixed budget of $10,000, and we'll distribute that amongst a smaller group of people. So here's another way of kind of where I'm leading us to in this discussion. This is plotting the bug bounties and basically how cost effective and efficient they're being and how, in other words, how many you're finding, get, reports you're getting over time and how much you're spending on those reports. So for example, let's say that we, deci we decide a, a normal pen test would be about two weeks and based on our payouts, we'll set, hit some ceiling of what that pen test is. If the amount of bounties we're paying over a short period of time is below this threshold, then actually this, this bug bounty program is probably even better than what we might pay consultants for, for a third party pen test, or an internal team doing their pen testing. Or we could simply say, we'll remain cost effective, but we'll let, just let this linger over time and just let the, the bug reports trickle in. So we can still be cost effective. We're not just being efficient with time. And perhaps this can be perfectly acceptable if we have a web application that's not changing drastically, or a web application, for example, that's legacy. And of course, we do want to avoid the stratospheric costs, where if we predicted that we were going to have two reports a week, about around $1,000 per report, $100,000 per year, but we end up spending a million dollars on our vulnerability discovery, perhaps we've made a mistake here. And that's one of the subtleties too, is that a bug bounty, you're actually paying for the amount of risk discovered rather than paying for the effort to find the risk as something much more traditional like a scanner would do or a consulting engagement from a pen tester. 
And here's where I wanted to, to pause a moment and, and, and say, scanners can still be an effective part of this risk discovery method. It's simply the idea that they probably will be down here cost effective. They'll have some overhead to them because there's going to be a noise, a few false positives, for example. They may need some care and feeding to keep them customized against the target application or applications. But they're probably going to be cost effective. They're going to be efficient, but there's going to be some ceiling over which there's going to be vulnerabilities that they're not capable of finding or simply vulnerabilities that it costs so much time and effort in order to get them to be effective at discovering those vulnerabilities. So that was talking about how efficient we are with, with a, a bug bounty program or with a vulnerability discovery program and how much money we're spending on it or what time it is. Um, remember when I mentioned that, that graph about the gaps? What if, we, what if it's been a month since we've gotten a valid report and we want to re-engage the group? Here's an idea of what that group might look like. Again, this is uh, about three years' worth of data from bug bounties. And what this is really saying is that 5% of the researchers contributed 50% of the total reports. So all the way down to 17% of the researchers contributed 80%. And basically half of the researchers out there contributed 95%, or the majority you know, of them took part. So Here's an idea that we don't necessarily want to add more and more and more people. Just growing the crowd isn't necessarily going to get us a lot more quality or a lot better uh, feedback about the security of our application. Instead, maybe we want to change and look at this 5% number. So if we have 1,000 people participating, maybe 50, 50 of them are being effective or 30 of them are being effective. And 30 to 50 is a much more manageable number in terms of that noise overhead or that social management overhead of defining scope, defining rules of engagement, going back and forth between payouts and evaluating the, the relative risk and impact. For comparison, I also want to talk about some uh, pen testing, for example. The curve looks somewhat similar. We have about 12% of the pen testers contributing half of the reports, uh, and about two-thirds of them actively contributing 95% or more of the reports. The nuance here isn't so much in the numbers. Uh, we, we can imagine that pen testers are probably more skilled. These are people who are doing this for a living rather than perhaps the huge variance you'll have within the group that is in a bug bounty program. But pen testing can also provide that, which isn't quantified here, which is harder to quantify, confidence in what's been tested but not reported. Meaning, if you run a bug bounty program and no one reports a cross-site scripting vulnerability, it's a bit of a toss-up between, is that because no one has looked for cross-site scripting or they've looked and they've not found any? Whereas a pen test that follows, for example, the OWASP ASVS or the pen testing methodology from OWASP is more likely to have confidence that the pen testers have gone through and in fact tested for cross-site scripting. And if they're not reporting the vulnerabilities, they can, that's, that's better feedback that says it's likely more secure or at least you, they can also give qualitative feedback about countermeasures or things that are inhibiting or making it harder to exploit, those particular types of vulnerabilities. And I like to call it like this, is a little bit of the, the law, of, law of bugs you might be familiar with, that we always have bugs, eyes are shallow. Just throwing more and more people at the problem isn't necessarily the best way to solve it. I also like to call this out as, are you practicing a bug ops program or a dev ops program? because just chasing bugs isn't a security strategy. Bugs in production apps are important. We definitely want to know about them, but we should be treating them as an engineering feedback mechanism um, and bringing them in to say, our DevOps process has some gap or has some weakness in it that let this particular flaw go through the design process, go through a code review process, go through a code check-in process, automated testing process, QA, and et cetera, et cetera, through that DevOps pipeline before and until it reached production, putting users' data at risk, putting the system at risk, et cetera. So this is where I say we want to practice risk reduction. Um, now, I don't know 300 years ago what the streets of Belfast might have been, been like, but if you were in the, walking the streets of Edinburgh, for example, reading the philosophical transactions on your tablet, wooden tablet perhaps, and you heard the phrase Guardy Lou, the last thing you'd want to do is look up to see what's going on. You'd want to actually step out of the way and avoid what's being thrown out the windows. 
So it's the idea of risk reduction here and saying, oh, here's another, and saying, perhaps there's a contagion or a plague throughout London. We're going to cancel our public meetings so that we all don't come fall victim to the plague, straight from the philosophical transactions themselves. But bringing this more towards an AppSec perspective, 300 years ago in internet time, in other words, roughly late 90s, early 2000s, here's an example of Microsoft investing time and money saying, every single consulting firm is making money off the double decode vulnerability, exploiting IIS. Bill Gates said, we're going to invest money, invest time in trustworthy computing. And essentially, since that era, there were very few IIS bugs reported until perhaps this year when there's an IIS bug reported in software that's already end of life. So it's an, so it's an example of rather than just chasing and fixing bugs, investing in a full re-architecture, which was significant undertaking, but effective. We can also talk about OpenSSL. 0.9 had bugs, 1.0 had bugs. But then groups of people said, we need to start removing some of this code. We don't need to support a lot of these operating systems that are essentially hobbyist operating systems or that are very rare. Or we don't need that hand-rolled assembly language or assembly language being built by Perl scripts. We want to revisit this and look at safe defaults for the application. And, a, and an even more interesting example, I think, or that I like about HTTPS is the Let's Encrypt project. For years, for well over a decade, for at least two decades, we said as a security community, please use HTTPS. You know, please use HTTPS everywhere. Just go ahead and use HTTPS. What the Let's Encrypt project did <clears throat> was say, we want to remove the barrier of cost. Certificates are free. So excellent. That's the initial barrier. You now have no excuse not to have budget for obtaining certs. But certs also require time management. They require renewal, rotation, ongoing management. It also requires overhead. And let's encrypt, <clears throat> use, the, use the ACME protocol to help improve that. So rather than saying and shouting, if you will, <clears throat> what they did was identify the problem and presented a solution to the problem that developers had. They said, you have a challenge with cost, a challenge with time. Here's how we're going to help you solve it. And one of the ways that, oh, sadly this chart isn't too clear, but one of the ways then bringing this back around to application security is how do we look at risk? So one of the ways that I've liked to chart it is by saying the average risk for a pen test, for example, charted against the number of findings within that pen test. And this average risk could be a scale of one to three, scale of one to five, it could be a CVSS score, but internal to your organization, it should just be consistent. And what the idea here is that if you have a lot of findings, probably indicates you have a lot of work to do. There's either a lot of bugs to fix, or the bugs are so pervasive, there's likely something that needs to be done in the sense of a design problem, or a re-architecture that needs to be accomplished. And we know that we always do have bugs, and that's where down here, there'll be low risk, there'll be a low number of them, but hopefully that's because we have other security controls within our DevOps pipeline to be able to say, to make those mistakes harder or easier to detect or less impact when they do happen. And this is where we leads us to risk strategies. So I said chasing bugs isn't a security strategy, but it's a little bit more helpful to be positive and explain what might be a strategy. So what we try to do is increase a number uh, or decrease a number. I'll start with that. We want to decrease, for example, the rate of reports for a particular type of vuln. Perhaps we want to decrease the rate of cross-site scripting reports coming in, or CSRF. So that way, we at least are saying, we're going to say May 11th, we're starting at zero. We're going to spike on May 12th because we've opened our bug bounty program. And over the month after month after month following that, we want to see what the trend is. Are we going up? Are we going down? The rate is something there that we want to decrease. Or we can set a goal, a milestone, or a goal to increase a number. In other words, we want to increase how quickly we deploy fixes. Here's the idea behind minimizing those duplicate reports. This can have an incidental help on the noise associated with your bug bounty program. If you can deploy patches more quickly, it's less likely that multiple researchers are going to report that same vulnerability. It's also a way to reduce risk. So for example, if you have the recent Google Docs phishing problem, I think it was about three hours between identification and fix for Google to come out and 
base and, and address that problem. So something like that, being able to respond in three hours rather than three days or 30 days um, is a significant way to reduce risk. And of course, there's also the other thing, deploying some countermeasures. If you're spending $5,000 a month on payouts for cross-site scripting, perhaps you might invest $1,000 a month into a WAF that can block a lot of them. So it's the idea of what are we actually spending What's the impact of that, and could we be smarter about spending that? Or maybe what we would do is take that budget, rather than saying to payouts, put it into a scanner, put it into training, put it into additional personnel that can help with doing security reviews. And the idea here is that we want to do something about reducing risk. So here's an explanation or kind of a metaphor that I like to use from the American Centers for Disease Control. Um, so disease or vulns within our application might be pandemic. In other words, it's, never, it's a new application, never had any security review, never had any security present. We've opened the floodgates upon the Dothraki hordes of the bug bounty testers, and they're finding tons of high-risk vulnerabilities. There's a lot of work to do. But what we'd like to do is rather than move up like the, if you're familiar with the Gard Gartner Magic Quadrant where everybody wants to move up and to the right, this is a bit of a tragic quadrant where up and to the right is bad, and we want to be down here on the sporadic. So the vulnerabilities that are found in a pen test, whether it's internal or external team, or that come in on a monthly basis from our bug bounty program, they'll be low in number, they'll be easy to fix, and they'll be very quick to fix, and they'll also potentially have a low payout. So you can even save money now rather than having that $10,000 end of the spectrum on your cross-site scripting, deploying content security policy deploying um, linters or scanners that are going to better identify when these types of problems are being made within development process. So those cross-site scripting are exploitable in concept, but not exploitable in practice due to additional countermeasures that exist within the application. So starting to close, I wanted to call out a few things that are sort of mindsets that contribute to either the noise or a horde or the good things of a scrutiny or of a crowd. Some of the things I'd call out are the ideas of, you know, users are stupid, developers are stupid. I mentioned the Google Docs phishing attack. If the first reaction is to start naming and shaming or making fun of people for having clicked on a link, that's probably going to discourage them from reporting that link or reporting that they did click on that to IT. When it's much better for IT or IT security to know that this happened so they can quickly respond and contain the problem rather than just letting it linger and getting worse. So it's much better if we can have more scrutiny or a crowd that's giving us feedback, a crowd that's giving us positive knowledge about what should some better safe defaults be for this particular software stack, be it an OpenSSL implementation, be it a MongoDB that probably shouldn't be a key value store that's sitting unprotected on the internet, um, or something along those lines. It's also an acknowledgement that we have crowds of people and we have bug bounties, Possibly because either no one's running tools against their systems to find those easy misconfigurations, or there's no effective tools for them. For example, DevOps um, and containerization with uh, Docker, for example, jumped ahead of the, of the security tooling. Security tooling is starting to catch up now, so we're closing that gap of tools about is this well configured or not, but that crowd of security testers and people need to follow along and give that feedback. And the final point there is that systems are complex. Even if we have tools, systems change, systems have um, interesting emerging vulnerabilities or different ways of, of exploiting them. And that's what we want to find with an effective crowd. And a final point I wanted to make about bug bounties is that there's two, two helpful aspects of them. One is that they actually formalize or they're a nod to formalizing that coordinated disclosure process. Meaning, we've moved beyond the late 90s when the bug bounty program, for example, would have been operated out of the legal department and researchers would have been responded to with legal threats or legal complaints. Now, bounty programs are more likely PR exercises, meaning public relations and pull requests. We're being friendlier on both sides of the equation between bug bounty researchers and, or, and the organizations, and we're also fixing bugs that exist in production. The other point is that there's also, people work for different incentives. 
I was talking about budgets and spending money on payouts or spending money on vulnerability discovery. But there's also that aspect of earning money. If 5% of the bug bounty researchers out there are, gain, are gaining 50% of that bug bounty budget, it's going to be tough if you're not part of that 5%. It's even going to be tougher if you're beyond that 21% and higher competing for that $3,000 budget. So it might be an investment in your time as in terms of paying for, you know, paying for whatever you wish to pay for. But the other point I want to make here is that it's also a great learning experience. We have the OAuth, like a web goat, a node goat, but learning against real world programs is a fantastic way to, to sort of reverse engineer how developers' minds work what goes on in real applications, how are real applications put together, and how do you communicate those problems. One of the other um, funny things that comes up around bug bounty is the beg bounty hashtag, which is a bit of naming and shaming, if you will, around bug bounty reports that are poorly written, or bug bounty reports that are divorced from the concept of risk or security. Learning and going through bug bounties against real-world applications are a great way to go through those exercises of evaluating risk and working with real-life applications. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight is we have a lot of different types of programs we can have. We could have public bounties, private bug bounties, where we're just inviting that small 5% group of researchers. But we can also have crowds related to threat intel sharing. So it's not just about vulnerability discovery, but about threat discovery, as well as what if we had a lot more fuzzing farms? A fantastic security effort would be to take all this code that we compile, and uh, C, C++ code, for example, compile it with LLVM with address sanitizer turned on and undefined behavior sanitizer turned on, see what happens. Just start reporting the bugs that come out of those, and then perhaps also identify which of those bugs have significant security problems associated with them. Things that would be great to do as sort of a crowdsource type of environment since there's so much open source code that everybody uses, everybody shares. And one of the other reasons I was really harping and, I, and showing these charts is to, is to emphasize the collection of metrics, emphasize what might be helpful metrics in terms of time and money and budget spent or money over time. Because if we collect that, we can start to build simple models, simple equations. So one model might have been two reports a week, $1,000 a report, $100,000 for our bug bounty payout budget. But perhaps we also put together some combination of what does the triage cost? What, does it, what might be saved if we can reduce the overhead of one in five of our vulnerability reports to become a being, a being valid up to four out of five vulnerability reports being valid. We could actually potentially shave 15% off of our overhead of managing that program. In other words, that hourly rate we might be paying or in one way or the other about people sifting through that noise. That 15% we could then perhaps change and reassign to scanners, reassign to training, reassign to conference attendance, for example. And the other thing I did was, this is just a sample of the risk distribution that we saw across bug bounty reports. So ostensibly, if you haven't done any testing or any security aspects where no security was present in the development of your application, it's possible that this might be what the profile looks like from low risk to critical risk of your application. So one of the questions is then, how many days are you happy to have this be both unanswered, or even if it is answered and your distribution looks somewhat like this, how many days are you happy maintaining this? Seven days, 30 days, 90 days? This speaks more to how risky is my app? Where sh what should I be fixing? Where should I be investing time and money into addressing that? And with that, leave you with the thoughts that we're attempting to find efficient vulnerability discovery methods. They can be people, but they can be people in bug bounty programs and different types of crowdsource models and different types of scanners, combination and hybrids of all three of those. And the point as well is that wisdom can come from crowds, scrutiny and security can come from crowds, but those crowds don't have to be massive. They can be 5% of the crowd having that significant amount of impact. And if you can identify who those people are, you can engage them and then take advantage of their skills, increase that vulnerability discovery, and then improve security uh, for everyone. And with that, 
I want to thank you for your time. Hi. Uh, so we've been comparing the cost efficiency between uh, between bug bounty programs and pen testing, and you must have picked uh, a daily rate for a security consulting uh, price, right? Uh, was it was it uh, an average security consulting uh, rate from US or uh, or where? Because you know, if you take the like majority, probably majority of uh, bug bounty hunters, they are from different countries and uh, where. There are different costs of living, uh, and in their countries, the the, the same skilled pen tester just earns uh, three or four times less, right? Like Eastern Europe or or uh, even India, or whatever, right? Uh, so the question is, have you made the statistics about uh, like what would be the average salary of bounty hunters across their countries? So that, that's a great point. And one of the things I tried to do is not make this too US-centric. I did use US dollars, since that's just easier to th mentally think with. And roughly, the, the hourly rate I chose for pen testers was around was $50. So to, to reflect the idea that there could be, um, um, uh, depending on where people, ge geographic distribution can have a significant impact. And the idea that the types of vulnerabilities that are being found um, are probably pretty much the same between an overlap between bug bounty and pen testers. Um, so I did choose $50 for that, but my um, recommendation would be, or the idea is more that that number of that, that pen test line may go up or down. And so a little bit depends on your organization, and you can play with that. So the idea is more of build a model, say, what are we actually paying over time on our bug bounties? And at what point are we actually surpassing a fixed cost, for example, for a pen test? And one of the ideas to, would be, too, one of the, um, uh, the other concepts is saying we have bug bounty researchers that perhaps are, you know, are happy and can make a good amount of money depending on where they are. But perhaps what if we can find out these are the really skilled ones that are giving us good reports and say, we've identified you 5% or this small group of 30 to 50 people. And in fact, we'll treat you like pen testers. We'll pay you a fixed rate. And so even if you don't find a vulnerability, we'll actually pay you for your time and money. And that's one of the things, too, that I didn't really touch on, but that in terms of equity and fairness, um, it's a bit of a gamble being a bug bounty researcher because maybe you're getting in that percentage where you'll actually get the payout. But a lot other times you may have spent, you know, let's just say an hour's worth of effort to identify a vulnerability, only be told, sorry, that's a duplicate, no payout. So you've lost that time. Whereas for a pen tester, somebody who's skilled with security or a bug bounty hunter that you're confident has good quality in results, you want to pay them for your time because they can give you that feedback that says, yes, this vulnerability exists, or I checked your OAuth implementation, or I checked your login workflow, and it doesn't have any vulnerabilities. So that would be more the message, the way I would, would describe that and answer that. Next question? Oh, oh, I think we have a question here. Apologies. Um, one of the points you talked about was whenever the rate of reports dries up, the conclusion being, well, perhaps they haven't tested that area, or perhaps there are no bugs left. But what about if the bug bounty is not adequate, and the person that finds it decides, rather than tell you, I'll tell somebody else because they'll, they'll pay me more? So that, that is a great question. So I didn't quite, I didn't go on the, the direction of the idea of you know dark market paying for bounties, because if you're Apple, and Facebook and Google, there's significantly a dark market or even a third-party market out there for those vulnerabilities. For smaller B2B SaaS, SaaS types of companies, I would, uh, perhaps uninformed, I think a safer bet is there's probably not a market for those vulnerabilities. However, to your point, it could be an answer that says, it's been 30 days, we haven't had any vulnerabilities. Perhaps that is a better point to say, let's increase, increase the payment schedule and maybe that by saying rather than the minimum of $50 for a vulnerability, we'll double it to 100 or let's say let's go up to $500 for a cross-site scripting vulnerability because we have that confidence in our that, that whatever countermeasures we've deployed will be there, and hopefully that will attract a good crowd to come back and say, now this actually may be worth my time. So my message around that was to say, 
watch that rate of reports, see when it does start to trickle off or dwindle into nothing, and start asking why that might be, and then you have some different ways to respond to it. Um, we can either say, nothing's been changing, all the volumes have been found because we're over-optimistic, or we do want to actually do something that gathers, that reinvigorates it, gathers more of a crowd. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.